Welcome to this very special, special session of NLF Imaginary Lines. We have the privilege of hosting an esteemed guest, cognitive neuroscientist and reading scholar, Dr. Marianne Wolf. I have been an ardent follower of Dr. Wolf's work ever since I read her book, Reader Come Home, The Reading Brain in a Digital World. And we have been in touch with her over the years to invite her as the guest for the festival. I'm thrilled that the occasion is finally here today. For those of you who are interested in the book or may wish to follow more discussions on it, we are also running a book club on Reader Come Home with two sessions left. We're doing this book now because we're living through strange and, hor strange and horrible times. It's important to look inward and engage in more reading, turn to books and build that reading world. And while doing that, build empathy and relationships with and for our young readers. As Dr. Marianne Wolf has so eloquently put it, NLF Imaginary Lines has, is a celebration of the power of books to change lives for every reader, beginning with our youngest readers. Reader Come Home is structured in the form of letters to a reader, as Marianne Wolf looks at what happens to the human brain when we read, how we can nurture the practice of deep reading in a digital distraction age, and the need for our children to nurture a biliterate brain to negotiate the challenges that the digital culture presents as they grow up. During our session today, I hope we can pull on two different sides of Dr. Dr. Wolf's work. The first is understanding the reading brain, especially in a digital culture. And the second is the impact of this knowledge on teaching and growing children in schools and in homes, how we as parents can use it in our work with children to nurture deep reflective readers in this technological age. Now first, so that our speaker also has a sense of our audience, let's meet our audience. We have a quick poll for you so that Dr. Wolf has a sense of who our audience is today. Kartika, can you launch the poll, please? I'm not able to launch it. Sure. And we'll take 60 seconds for that. Thank you for responding. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Stop, please. Can you share the results? Yes, thank you. So that's what our audience is today. 88 or 61% are from Bangalore, 33% from another city from India, 5% from outside India from Asia, 1% from in from the US and 1% from elsewhere in the world. And are you a parent educator? 32% are parents, 50% today are educators, 6% are librarians and association uh, associated with the education and publishing industry. And this you can see 6%. Um, it's lovely. I would have loved to know how many children there are in the audience, but we will leave that for another time. Thank you so much. Now before I before I um, before we introduce our speaker, we would like to go over some housekeeping rules with the audience. You can ask your questions using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. In fact, if you already have questions, please feel free to type them in. And about 20 minutes into the session, we will get to questions. If you raise your virtual hand, we would not be able to attend to your question. Hence, we would recommend that you use the Q&A box to share your thoughts and questions with us. Now, over to our speaker. Can I welcome Dr. Marianne Wolf? Wonderful. Dr. Marianne Wolf is a scholar, teacher, and advocate for children and literacy around the world. She is the lit director of the Center for Dy Dyslexia, Diverse Learners, and Social Justice at US UCLA uh, in the Graduate School of Education and Information Literacy. 
She is Chapman University's Presidential Fellow and Past Fellow and Research Affiliate at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. Her awards include many, many honors, highest honors from the Interna International Dyslexia Association and the Dyslexia Foundation, the Einstein Prize, Fulbright Fellowship, the Christopher Columbus Award for Intellectual Innovation for co-founding Curious Learning, a global literacy initiative with deployments in Africa, India, and many other countries, and many, many other awards. She's an advisor to the IMF and a frequent speaker about global literacy at the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. Dr. Wolf has authored over 170 scientific publications, curricula for dyslexia, and tests for reading prediction, besides two wonderfully informative and thought-provoking books. Proust and Squid, and Reader Come Home. In the last year, she received awards for reading research and for her work on the effects of different media on intellectual development. But very special and most recently, she was elected as a member of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. And we will talk a little bit about that. Welcome, Dr. Wolf, to the NLF Imaginary Lines Book Club. Thank you, Kavita. It's a pleasure to be there almost in person and someday I hope in person. I hope so too. And it's an incredible gift to have you with us today. We, let me not take up any more of our time and hand it over to you, Ms. Wolf, if you could take, if you could lay the ground for us uh, on why you, you do the work that you do, what led you to it, and uh, also um, sketch out some of that work for us. If you could take uh, some time and sketch that out, it would be wonderful. Over to you. Well, Kavita, I decided to do something unusual. I decided that since the very light motif, the very theme of your festival is the story and the power of stories, I decided to give you my own story. And I don't usually tell people this, but especially since this is a literary festival that's in honor of our children and the transformative power, it is the case that my life really began in essence because of books. I grew up in a very tiny little town in the very middle of the United States. And my parents were wonderful, but they were just the most, the most um, devoted parents to our education. But they, they were like everybody else except for one thing, and that was they decided to put me in the one school in all of this bottom part of the state that was um, a more spiritual school, a religious school, uh, run by two nuns. Now, Kavita, that meant that unlike everybody else, I went to a school with two rooms, four grades on one side, four grades on the other. And so I was always learning all of this material until about second grade. Now this is part of the story I want children to know. I always talked too much and I got in trouble. And so my teacher, Sister Rose Margaret, went to my parents and said, we have a problem. She knows everything the fourth graders should know and she's talking because she's bored. At that moment, Kavita, something so special that changed my life happened. Suddenly, the back of the room was filled with books. My parents, who were ordinary parents, they weren't super rich uh, in any way, but they gave all of this money that they had to build a library for my little school. And that was the beginning of setting me on what became like a great books program. Instead of being bored, I was reading constantly. And when I wasn't reading in school, I was on my bicycle going to the library to find new books. So by the time I graduated from eighth grade, I was so involved in the world of books that it didn't matter that my little town had 4,000 people or that I had only two rooms to my schoolhouse. I had the whole world because of books. And that taught me some lessons 
that lasted my whole life. So that when I went to high school and college, and finally when I, I, I went to Harvard, um, I was almost a, a woman, a walking library. My knowledge was informed by books. But something happened to me, Kavita, that has something very special to tell you and your educators who are in the audience. In between, I had two degrees in English literature, but in between that and going to the Harvard Reading Lab, I taught in a tiny little Peace Corps-like mission school in rural Hawaii, where it was really like indentured servants. The children came from parents who were so poor that most of the parents were not literate. I realized from that moment on the power of literacy to transform a life. I had my personal experience, my, if you will, my love affair with books, but I learned something else. And that is what happens when you cannot read or you cannot read well enough to go beyond functional literacy. If I couldn't teach these children to read, I feared for their future. And the reality was I didn't teach everyone to read in that classroom. And my very failure to reach some of those children convinced me from that moment on, I was going to understand what it took to read, what it took to teach reading, and how we could, in essence, in give that knowledge to everyone. But I had to have the knowledge myself. So that's why I actually went to the Harvard um, University's, what was called then the, um, the reading lab. And it was there that I discovered neuroscience and linguistics. And I realized how beautifully complex the reading brain is. That it's not what most people take for granted, that we don't have a brain that's born to read. We have a brain that has to form an entire new circuitry. And so part of my work as a graduate student was to first immerse myself. What happens in the brain when it retrieves a single word when we read it? What are all the processes that are involved? And that began a lifelong research into trying to understand all the parts, the component processes that go into reading. Because, now this was a fundamental insight. If I can understand the major processes of the reading brain, I can give that knowledge to teachers. Because teaching, especially in the 20th century, was so locked into your either whole, what was called whole language, still is whole language, or phonics. And people didn't realize that the reading brain really shows us we absolutely must have those foundational skills that phonics teaches. And you have to learn how to teach that. But at the same time, you have to learn how to inspire the development of language areas. And when I say inspire, I mean inspire. I mean our children have to have a love affair with words because that is what our children need, not just the, the foundation. That is essential, but foundation plus love because then they want to read themselves. That's what will help them form a reading life. So my time as a, as a graduate student was preparing my, what would be from that point on, a research program in how to take knowledge about the reading brain into the classroom for teachers so they would understand how best to teach, but also how much more important reading is than any of us ever realized, I think, in the 20th century. I believe this moment in time, when we are actually changing and becoming 
in essence, less good readers as a society. Never has it been more important to realize the complex contributions that reading makes to critical analysis, to empathy, to understanding the perspective of others so that in this very high powered connected world, we do not fall into the trap of only looking at our own perspectives. Reading is one of the great antidotes to the challenges that we are all faced, whether it's the COVID virus that isolates us or whether it is in many places, the, the effects of social media on causing people to actually move their attention in such distracted ways that they aren't able to be critically analytic readers. So there are so many things that this study of the reading brain has, has taught me, but over time, it became my, if you will, my mission to share not just my knowledge, but my love. So your festival gives me a chance to tell both the story, the autobiography of a love affair with words and books, but also um, an opportunity through questions with you and your audience to really go under the surface of reading and realize how complicated, how beautiful it is, and how necessary it is that you, this audience, make sure that we teach our children well so that they will think their furthest best thoughts when confronting a world in which confusion and distraction are everyday if you will the everyday fodder of what children are getting so we who love and teach reading and understand it have never been more important, I believe, than this moment. So that's a quick story. I'm a teacher, I'm a reader, I'm an advocate, and I want every child to have their best shot by becoming the furthest, their best reading self, if you will. So that's my so little much. story. Thank you so much for that. You forgot to say you're a storyteller. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, that was just beautiful. And I was trying to quickly find in your book, which I d had not tagged that page where you talk about the importance of stories and the importance of stories and the once upon a time and, you know, and hopefully also the happily ever after. And, um, and, and that's what you just did for us. Yes. Wait, Thank you, you so much. Our storytellers. And, and, you know, um, if we look at the entire history that we have, um, if you think about Homer and before we had um, a written language system, it was the story and music. Music is very important. So the story and the music, this is, this is part of who we are as a species. Yes, and I, I've read that in some of your articles as well, that, you, that you've spoken about uh, uh, the multiliterate brain and, and music and, and uh, also technology and all of that. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for sketching that out. And I'm really tempted to go more into the science of reading, but I will save that for later. Uh, it looks like we already have a lot of questions, but I will take it a bit at a time. Uh, so let me, since you've spoken about the science of reading, can I start with asking you a bit about, uh, about this in you know, the election to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences? And that is so exciting because um, you are five among 80 men, five, there are five women among 80 men and you're one of them. And uh, what does it say about, about, about this? And, you know, and I think many of these people are uh, Nobel laureates in physics and chemistry and biology. I understand that this society was originally founded by Galileo Galilei himself and that is so incredible. Now, what does this say for the acceptance of reading as a science? It is, I think it's so incredible. So would you share that? What does it say about reading as a science? Um, Kavita, I have to say, I only found out about this just not, I mean, two weeks ago. And so I'm still rather reeling from it. But the way I, I hypothesize it happened is because this amazing pope, 
Pope Francis yeah. has a grave responsibility and feels it towards the poor and the disenfranchised of the world. And so one of his most important, his two important missions, one is climate and, and saving our earth, and second is saving our children, especially the children of the poor and the disenfranchised. And literacy is the foundation of education. And I believe that what he was doing or through his chancellor um, was saying, we want, and he has said this publicly, we want a new compact for education in which science informs education, in which the science, in this case, the science of reading is applied to the lives of children. So I, I want to say that I do, I, and I'm going to be very frank, I do not feel worthy, but I feel responsible with this um, beautiful election. And I take it as my particular, if you will, charge by the Academy of Science to represent the application, the translation of science for the good of children especially the children of the poor and the children who are disenfranchised. I think it also has something beautiful to say to a literature or literary festival, and that is it is another um, recognition of how extraordinary that cognitive function is, that literacy is one of the greatest discovery inventions that the human brain ever has, has done in its history. And this in a different way, in the more science um, uh, aspect, is saying we have a science of the reading brain and we can apply it. That is a, that's two parts of the message, if you will, and it's quite beautiful. That is that is right. So you know when you when you when you look at just your notes and and those of many other writers, um, right from you know from 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 Socrates and um, and on from there to many other thinkers, the thought process that uh, that knowledge is an art, that knowledge is something that you know one person imparts to the other, and there's that art of knowledge. But to convert it into a technology, to convert it into a science, I think that's that's one of the greatest technological revolutions because that means it has a structure and we can pass it on and we can build it, which is so important. So thank you so much for sharing that. And I know that um, Pope Francis and also Dalai Lama and others have spoken about the uh, about reading and reflection being the antidote to uh, at this time to um, to the culture of isolation and um, and of the alone together generation that Sherry Turkle calls it right so they, they spoke about many of them have spoken about how reading is uh, the antidote and reflection uh, that it creates is the antidote um, so what is the link if you could talk about it between uh, reading uh, and therefore language reading language cognition and empathy and if you could go a little bit further, I'm sort of starting at the end of your book and saying yeah. that, you know, how yeah. does it lead to a democratic yeah. society? How does it lead to that third reading life? When yes. you know the digital chain hypothesis and yes. how books are changing because readers are changing or are readers changing because books are changing? I'm just wondering, what is the link, first of all, between reading and empathy and reading and democratic society, if you could talk about that a bit? Yes. So one of the, the striking insights I had after, re, after actually writing Proust and the Squid uh, was that we are absolutely changing the reading brain this moment. And I had not anticipated, that was in 2007. And I had been researching, of course, for many years, but that book took seven years to write. And at the end of it, um, I, I used the term, I felt like Rip Van Winkle. Where have I been? Reading has changed under our fingertips. So the end of that book was actually the beginning of the process that ended with Reader Come Home, in which I was, I was, I, I, I was overwhelmed with 
the changes that I had begun to see, but we didn't have the research then that we have now. So I'm going to first tell you a little bit about the research on the reading brain and empathy, and then link it to democracy later, because your, your question really has about four different parts. So I'm going to lead you through them by, by first saying that at the end of the Proust and Squid period in my life, I felt I understood, but didn't have a word yet, uh, but I understood deep reading. And only after I finished the book did I write articles that used the term deep reading to describe what I had originally just been talking about multiple comprehension processes. But I realized we have to understand this because these processes are so precious for our society. So the first of them is that after we build these decoding or foundational skills, and we must always have an emphasis on saying those have to be in place so that the deep reading can be connected to it. So it's never either or, it has, they, they both have to be there. But deep reading begins with taking the background knowledge of the person and by making an analogy, makes a connection between what you know and what is new in the text. So that becomes the, if you will, the beginning of the more sophisticated cognitive processes that are happening. Those then become the, the, the fodder, the stuff from which we make inference. But simultaneously, and here's where your question about empathy comes in, and most people do not understand how this is happening interactively, we are leaving ourselves, whether it's the Dalai Lama, Pope Francis, or people just uh, who are your librarians. We all know that reading, if we are reading at a level of, 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 of leaving ourselves behind, we take on the perspective of others. That is the foundation for empathy. It means we aren't staying with our own viewpoint, our, our own, if you will, go back to my little town in Illinois. I left Illinois. I left the United States. I, I was in England a lot of the time, I have to say, but I was in the 19th century. But most of all, I was learning that I'm not the center of the world. I can enter the world, the feelings, the culture, the religion, the historical time of other. This is one of the most important aspects of deep reading. So when we're talking about deep reading, talk about cognition, inference, analogy, but we're also talking about affect. And I sometimes talk to people about the reading brain is both science and poetry, like your name, Kavita. It is the science and the and the poem of, of what we have when we connect with text. Well, that becomes the basis. Now, here's where we're getting closer to the link to democracy. All of this information, this interactive processing, becomes the basis for discerning the truth of what we're reading. We're going back and forth between our right and left hemispheres. We are building a, if you will, a decision. Is this true? Can we, from all our inference, from all our being, uh, entering that world, is this something that is a true thing? Or, and here's where, this becomes the basis for critical analysis. All of those processes are the basis for critical analysis. Now, what happens when you short those processes? What happens when children don't learn deep literacy or deep reading? Well, they become susceptible to false information, unanalyzed information, information that they just take for granted and say, oh, it's written, therefore it's true. 
they become susceptible and even if I, I will use a very harsh word, they become the potential victims of demagoguery and, and lies. Whether it's the confusion of um, certain political or religious or cultural groups who want a perspective unanalyzed in that silo, whatever it is, we need to have citizenry who are developing these deep literacy skills so that they can be empathic, understand that others have legitimate voices and that a democracy will succeed or fail according to the ability to allow, permit multiple voices to be heard and to be listened to. The failure of one state after another, if we look historically, is when that doesn't happen. And so in modernity, this moment in history, with no ill intention in the beginning of social media's um, origins, I think some of the best intentions were in the origins, the worst consequences are happening when people, because of bombardment, this is the digital hypothesis, because of bombardment, they are becoming skimmers, not deep readers. And when you skim, you short circuit the reading brain's capacity for critical analysis. And when you are skimming, not only how you read is changing, but the publishers are looking at, well, if you're only skimming, well, let's do something shorter. Let's do something less dense. Let's do something that doesn't require all that critical analysis. So we're really also affecting not only how we read, but that affects what we read and what is written and how it's written. And ultimately that will come down to who, what, who are controlling what is being read by us. And we are losing control at a certain level in a democracy when we do not have that kind of openness to multiple perspectives of knowledge. And that we don't have, at least in the United States especially, our, our news media and our, our sources of knowledge being so polarized instead of giving us multiple perspectives that we can learn from. So democracy, I believe, is threatened by readers who do not develop deep reading skills of empathy and critical analysis. I'll say one final word because you mentioned contemplation and the Dalai Lama and others. It is by no coincidence that many religious leaders across religions have a um, very special place for meditation and contemplation across cultures, across religions. And it's not so much the religion, but the quest, the search for the spiritual, for the good. That requires time. And the end of the deep reading processes really goes beyond critical analysis. It uses critical analysis, it uses empathy, but it has this, if you will, this rarefied capacity to go beyond all of that. And in our most contemplative stance gives us that if you will, that sanctuary, that placeholder where our furthest, our own furthest thoughts can be germinated. And so this is, this, this very end of the reading process is not something we all have every day. We're lucky if, if we have that happen in some of our reading. My dearest hope is that in reading, especially my last letter, that people will understand that this is the acme 
The contemplative aspect of reading is the acme. And I want that so desperately because I think that is our antidote. That is, that is and will help us maintain democracy. It's a very long answer, Kavita. I, you had four parts and so I, I kept trying to answer them. I have so many questions. So I've basically tried to bunch them together so that I can ask you less questions, but that does not mean that the answer will be shorter, right? So it's... <laughs> for sharing this. I think one of the things that your book has made me do, uh, Marianne, is that it's taken me to many other books and books that I've liked and books that I've also not liked, but I've seen them with a new lens. And you know, and one of those books in this journey for me was uh, was this one, Yuval Noah Harari and the 21 uh, Lessons for the 21st yeah. Century, which is yeah. I love his sapiens, but not so much this one. But what you're talking about right now, that third reading life, and that's actually his last chapter on meditation as yeah. well. But yes. know, I wanted to, what I want to connect with, because you've moved us into many different um, times with your response, and I want to move us to the digital culture. And he speaks about this in the context of education. And um, he speaks about, I think it's the 19th lesson in his book, is about education. Uh, and the 17th lesson is about ignorance. And, uh, you know, and I think those two connect with what the culture of the digital revolution today is. If we don't use it responsibly, it's very important, but we have to use it responsibly. So so he speaks about how change is the only constant and how do we make ourselves equipped to learn. Uh, but if we leave ourselves open to algorithms controlling us and feeding us, and you spoke about that as the demagoguery. So I'm just connecting those thoughts and saying that, you know, group think. And when we are giving ourselves to technology without thought, how we give into group think, which you will know Harari talks about in his 17th letter on, uh, on 17th lesson on ignorance. Um, and I think it's, you know, so how do we, and you know, when, when you look at that new movie, Social Dilemma, and that is really scary. And I know now that you were interviewed for that movie. <laughs> so I would love for you to talk about this, that, you know, on one side, we are talking about this, um, culture where reading is really hard and it needs work and it's we've not spoken about that adequately i think you know but i think it just needs a lot of work and on the other side there is this digital culture and social media and i didn't know until recently that gmail is also addictive and of course it is i mean i'm checking gmail all the time haven't i and my kids are telling me to put my phone down thank god for them responsible people but it's uh, you know so the, there's no pull from this side because this is hard work right and there's a pull, there's a huge pull because of persuasive design is what all those ethicists and all of them talk about from the other side. Mm -hmm. um, how do we, how do we, how do we deal with that? How do we ensure that our children don't fall prey to that pull that exists without uh, conscious thought um, until the time that they own, you speak about it as internal knowledge. So how do we ensure that our, until our internal knowledge pool for our children is not built, they don't fall prey to what this external knowledge pool is, you know, and we talk about self management, we talk about all that, but we know the frontal cortex is not developed until 25. So how, how in a place where reading is hard, contemplation is hard, and this is so easy out there, right? And people are pulling you to it and they're working on it. How do we, how do we help our children navigate this world? Okay. Um, Kavita, it is, I believe, one of the hardest questions that anyone can and must try to address. And I will say that if, if there was something that I could in my life right now give, it would be the idea of promoting digital wisdom alongside an understanding of what I will call the biliterate brain. And I'm going to um, first go back to the fact that most of our children right now are in fact not reading. They're not picking up a book or a magazine. Um, the, the data on this are very clear. Our children are reading a lot, but they aren't reading in any sense deep or close reading of books or magazines um, compared to even 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. It's completely shifted from about 
60%, let's say 40 years ago, kids would at least once or twice a week read a book or read a magazine or something. And now we're somewhere between 13 and 14%. In other words, they aren't doing it. But what they are doing and they are, they are saying, well, when we, we have something in print or when we say something in screen, we want to do it on the screen because we read faster. It, we get it done faster. Reading in a book slows us down. And these are observational anecdotes that come from all over the world. Reading a book slows me down. Well, now that is connected to now uh, here's where I'm going to put my research hat on. One of the largest meta-analysis that have been done that was in the Guardian article that I, that I wrote and I think you gave your readers. Um, 171,000 subjects. We have a lot of people in that analysis who simply looked at the same story in print or on the screen. And then they were asked questions and their comprehension was better when it was with print than it was on the screen. It was better even when the kids, uh, these were young adults, were quote unquote digital natives. In, in other words, more recent data. This was a 17 year meta-analysis from 2000 to 2017. Now, when you ask them, there was an Israeli uh, researcher, Rockefeller, Ackerman, she did, uh, she, she, she wanted to understand what are they perceiving? And they were perceiving themselves better on the screen. And you ask them, well, why do you think you're better? And they said, well, of course, we're faster. So the speed with which we are processing information on the screen is in part due to the medium itself. The medium moves us along. In the words of Naomi Barron, who, who does some wonderful work with Ann Man and all this, the screen hastens the reader along. Whereas the book, I pick up the book and I, it's concrete. The very concreteness of it gives almost a geometry to my reading process. But by no means does it hasten me along. I can skim it, I can skim anything. But the reality is that the screen gives me an almost automatic association to skimming while the book allows me and encourages me to slow down and think. So we have a real problem with technology that it has two things that are so worrisome to me. One, it encourages partial, this is the word by Linda Stone, partial attention, but it encourages it and she uses the term continuous partial attention. Now, there's no way you are going to activate all those abstract, sophisticated processes if you are partially attending. You don't get down to critical analysis. All these are interactive processes in the brain. You are not activating them if you're distracted. And there's two forms, there's many forms of distraction, but the screen gives you, no matter what, a desire to go to the next, the next, the next. It has a, it has a built-in advantage for multitasking. But it also, especially if you look even in my own a uh, reading of the New York Times. I have it both print and I have it. Um, I have it on. You know, I I have it on my cell phone. Well, there are a thousand distractions when I read those articles that are right in front of me. Even though I am telling everybody else, don't do that. We're <laughs> all victims <laughs> of our time and. What we have to do in, in terms of digital wisdom is to teach our young to ask a very important question. Why are you reading this? If it's your email, skim away. If it's a poem that you want to think about, if it's a story 
that you really want to enter. If it's a contract, if it's a referendum, if it's a will, you better print it out so that you have concentrated attention and you're using your all of your interactive processes. So that's, a, that's a, another long answer about we need digital wisdom. We need, we need to understand the knowledge that we have now about what is best for what purpose. I can't believe Kartika is already here, which means we have to turn it over to audience questions. But I will connect this to one more thought before we go. And I think it's, you know, so what you're advocating is not just that don't do, do digital technology, but know what the purpose of that is. And that brings me to this thought of, you know, Guy Claxton and his, uh, his book on what's the point of school. And he speaks about intrinsic motivation. He speaks about the power of questioning. And he brings this up to say that, um, uh, so I'm, I'm wondering how we can, you know, how can we bring that together with this is, is what I'm wondering that that intrinsic motivation and leading children with questioning children will learn what they want to learn. So how can we hook, bring them into that uh, through reading and through accessing the digital world? How do we make them volunteers in their learning journey instead of bystanders, right? So it's, so it, it is that thought process, but I will now with that turn that turn it over to Kartika so, so we can get some audience questions and where does the time fly? I know. I talk too much. I told you in second grade I was in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Kavita and Marion. It's been lovely to listen to both of you, but we have a bunch of audience questions, which is why I thought it was a good time to step in. Uh, we're going to start with a comment and a question from Aruna, who's in the audience. Oh, okay. Aruna! Oh, <laughs> I have to tell everyone. Now, I'm not going to, Aruna, I'm not going to say your last name as well as I should, but oh. it's uh, Shankaramaranayadnan. <laughs> is that as close as I can get? She's so wonderful. I can't believe it. Oh, and Prayatna was, su was such a greatest contribution to literacy. I'm so proud of her. Okay, Aruna. Right. So Aruna says, wonderful listening to you live, Marianne. Many countries, including the US and India, are growing more polarized. And this polarization is getting exacerbated by digital media as they offer us truths based on our political leanings. So even if people read deeply, they aren't necessarily exposed to alternative perspectives. Is there a way out of this impasse? Arina, I have to tell you, this is the, the battle that I am myself trying to uh, figure out what we can do. And it is, um, I do not have an answer because I, my own country, I thought I had answers. I thought that a uh, logic was um, always going to be on the side of critical reasoning and thinking, but I am finding that people's um, that people have truly gone to silos, whether it's in news media or in uh, on their internet. They are they're only going to one perspective. So I have been trying, and Aruna, you 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 will undoubtedly remember the work of Lawrence Kohlberg at Harvard on Moral Development. I have been asking people to think about moral dilemmas for children, and I'm actually writing about this, in which there's no one right answer, but that we have to ask what are the values that we bring to bear on different situations. So I'm, I'm literally writing about this, uh, Aruna, because I'm trying to get people to understand there is no one perspective, but there are values, principles, Socratic first principles that we should be thinking about whatever silo we're in so we realize there are other perspectives. Uh, but Aruna, I think this is one of the absolute major challenges of our times across cultures. And um, social media has, has contributed greatly to this polarization. And I'm hoping that at some level that all of us, you, you Aruna, 
all of us who are in the field of working to help children that our very emphasis on empathy and critical analysis every single day of our lives, to me, that is the hope that I have. I don't have an answer, but I have a hope and a Tolstoyan belief that what are we to do? We are to do what's in front of us. Whether it's writing letters to the editor, in some cases, in protest, in resisting of that kind of, of um, if you will, fascism of ideas, we don't want that. We must work for true, empathic, democratic voices. But thank you for the question. And Runa, thank you for all of your work in literacy in India over these years. Thanks so much, Marianne. Uh, we have a question from Nadine Bailey, who is a teacher librarian with the Western Academy of Beijing. Um, how does reading development map to cognitive development or critical reading? Some of these skills are still underdeveloped until the teen years. Mm -hmm. This is really true. Um, what, we are, what I'm always asking people to think about is that um, we will be developing our critical thinking the rest of our lives. And what we are doing is through literature, in, in essence, we are helping cognition develop. Um, Piaget in, uh, was certainly one of the great thinkers about cognitive development. And he had the concept of disequilibrium as part of what we are doing in literature, in, 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 so, in social studies, in learning about other cultures. And disequilibrium is when we, uh, when we offer our children, um, and books do this in such beautiful ways, viewpoints that literally are different from their own and cause them to think differently. Well, this is in Piagetian terms, a kind of molting. So we have disequilibrium that causes us to think more and that actually furthers our cognitive development. So I would like to even um, say that the very choice of our books can help cognitive development, both in giving background knowledge, but also in giving the kind of disequilibrium that causes more thought to happen to resolve some of the unease we have. So critical, critical thinking is going to be developing all throughout the lives of, of all of us. Every person here who is listening to you, there are things you are disagreeing with me. That is good because that's gonna cause you to think for yourself about what you think. And that's what we wanna do for our children as well. Thanks, Marianne. We have an interesting question from Joanna Ribello, who's a children's book writer and an editor. Uh, listening to Kevin Barry reading Night Boat to Tangier, I felt the story about the two Irish gangsters acquired greater authenticity and cultural rootedness because of the writer's Irish accent. It got me wondering if and how a narrator's timber, pitch, inflection, and accent affects one's reading of a book. I was wondering about your thoughts on the subject. What a beautiful and interesting question. Um, I think it does. I, um, you, you, you heard me talking about just even just the, the flicker of a thought about music. You see, uh, words have many, many aspects, but prosody is a part of it. The melody of words. Well, I have a different prosodic contour than, um, than you, Karthika. Uh, we have a different melody. When I hear your melody, I am moved into India. And when you hear an Irish accent, or if I'm reading Faulkner, for example, or Flannery O'Connor, and Flannery O'Connor will sometimes imitate the Southern accent so perfectly, I'm transported even more. So this is a beautiful question by a writer that um, from a linguistic viewpoint, it makes even, uh, it, it makes science, a uh, 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 sense from the science viewpoint too, that prosody adds to what, what a word has. It's one more of the beautiful properties of, of language. Thanks, Marianne. Uh, we have an interesting question that's come up. 
um, how can we make children question what they're reading and why, why they're reading? How can we make them volunteers in their learning journey so that they learn to navigate the digital world powerfully and don't fall prey to the social dilemma design of society? Mm -hmm. So there have been some wonderful people who are doing great research on this. Um, Tommy Katsir in um, Israel is doing some very interesting work. Islands of Hope, she has a curriculum. Um, there are people at Stanford, Sam Weinberg, who's doing work on digital literacy. Um, there are various people around the world who are trying to uh, discuss what digital wisdom is for our children so that they ask the question, why are we reading? This, from the very start, from early on, Tommy Katsir's work is fourth, fifth grade, sixth grade. Um, Sam Weinberg is, is a little older, but all of them are, are, are from the beginning times when a child is fluent, uh, that is automatic and they're decoding and able to comprehend, let's say certainly around third and fourth grade, that's a point in time where I think we can really be helping our children ask those questions. Why? Why? What, what is the purpose of this reading? So that digital properties can be used to, to their advantage, but digital threats can be vigilantly learned from the start. Uh, Julie Quarot from Rhode Island is another one who is doing work on digital um, wisdom. Um, but what, what I think the core of that question is, is not so much digital versus print, but to ask the question so that you are thinking even before you read, why, what will this, where will this take me? What will I learn? And to have a set, just as Kavita asked me um, in one of her questions, how can we have this set towards learning and knowledge instilled in our, in our children? The internal motivation, the intrinsic motivation, the love of learning. And that's where I really hope that books and the digital world can somehow in this biliterate brain that I'm hoping for, give both all of this beauty that preserves the deep reading skills in that books have given us, but also gives us the kind of all these different forms of complementary knowledge that the digital world can give. So it's neat, it's, it's never either or, but how, how, can we, how can we give both to our children in the best way? But it, we have to teach them. We cannot wait till they're older. And that segues into our last question, Kavita. I'd like to combine a few questions actually. Okay. Uh, uh, Kartika. So I'm combining a question of Bindu Agarwal, who's an educator from Bombay, and uh, Paro Anand, who's a wonderful writer and a recent grandmother to two wonderful uh -huh. babies. Um, and um, and um, and uh, a few other people here who are talking about uh, how, what can we as teachers and librarians and, and grandparents and parents, what can we do to build uh, reading but I'd like to combine that with seeing from what the other questions are asking that in a world where there is there are videos and there are so many other forms of information, how can we balance them all, grow deep readers from zero to teens and uh, build a culture of reading, but also help children uh, absorb from many other forms of media? Sorry, a combined question, but that will be the last question. Okay. so. Um, this gives me an opportunity to say something which I haven't said before, and that is um, across the world, I believe that we should have three things happening. The first is that there should be a campaign between zero and five for all the organizations, whether they're the pediatricians, we have something called Reach Out and Read, where the pediatricians give a book at a well visit. Um, there are many organizations in India and the United States and other countries that are all, that should be united around a campaign in which parents know 
and grandparents know that the best way to, to, to literally activate the language regions of the brain are to read, speak, and sing to your child, not videos. And the work of people like Catherine Hirsch, Pasek, and others, they show us that all this video b between zero and two, you have better language development if it's with the parent or the siblings. And so grandparents and parents unite, read to your child every single night you can from zero to five. From five to 10 is when I would like our children to have and, and I should have said in zero to five, I want books. I want concrete books. I want the digital media, the devices, as, as frugally, as gradually as possible. And then at between five and 10, I would like them to have parallel paths so that reading begins with books and it's taught that five to 10 years that it's really, you know, that all of these skills are being developed with books so that we can encourage this close and deep reading. At the same time, in parallel, we're learning coding and programming and we're learning how to look and to have resources in the digital world so that we're having this foundational, uh, uh, the foundations of the reading life come from books and the love of them and building background knowledge and practice with um, uh, the, the computer, uh, the, the, the digital apps for reading can give a lot of good practice as well as background knowledge. So we're doing this five to 10 period. From 10 on, I really want, if possible, the deliberate teaching of deep reading for our teachers to communicate to children so that we really have book literacy and digital literacy coming together in a way that preserves and expands. So my real hope is that we preserve the unbelievable precious gem that we have in this reading brain now as we expand it in the 21st century with all these very necessary and beautiful digital skills. No either or, but the best of both. <laughs> Thank you so, so, so much, Marianne. This has been a, just absolutely, absolutely incredible. I, you know, I hate that we've run out of time. We have so many great questions and so many thoughts as young there's so many questions from the audience. There's so many questions I still have unanswered. But I think it's, uh, you know, I, I just want to extend that last bit where you've spoken about coding and the way you speak about uh, learning to read and reading to learn and think. But then you also speak about learning to code and coding to learn. In yes. the, it, yes. I think yes. it's the eighth letter, uh, building the biliterate brain is where yeah. that goes and i invite all of our readers to please read her book it's just it is fantastic it is so uh, instructive but not in a prescriptive manner uh, it leaves a lot of thought and we are building it together and that's why it's in the form of letters um, and now marianne i'm good i'm just going to blame you for this because you engage the audience right away with your story at the beginning and no good deed goes unpunished so we are going to keep turning up at your doorstep again, and again to engage you more how do we possibly answer all these questions thank you so much thank you so much marianne for joining us yes. taking the time out late at night for you it's been absolutely wonderful and you know, parting words in War and Peace, Leo Tolstoy wrote that the two most powerful warriors are patience and time. The prescription is very clear. But now all of us have said TLDR, too long didn't read. All of us need to now fight it, right? And deep but reading is always about connection. Uh, it's about, and there's so many thoughts, so many stories. E.M. Forster, one of the lines that you left in your book, only connect. Yeah, only uh, connect. Yes, yes. Connect, well, connecting what we know to what we read. And I'm, I'm now reading your words, connecting what we know to what we read, what we read to what we feel, what we feel to what we think and how we think to how we live our lives in a connected world. The future, any future depends on our understanding of the good reader and the role of
deep reading in how we live our lives. So thank you so much for that, Marianne. And we hope to see our listeners and readers for the third session of the NLF Imaginary Lines Book Club for Parents and Educators, which is on, on uh, this Wednesday. Uh, Sujata Narona will be joining us from, uh, from uh, Goa, and uh, she will be sharing with us uh, letter seven. So please, the science and poetry, much of what Marianne has spoken about today, I mean, in small part, but, uh, but you, we will go deeper and deeper into it. My brain is absolutely racing with the possibilities of leveraging all I can read and all I want to read now. But as Marian, Marian's book ends with the wonderful and wise words, Festina Lente, I think, Marian, that, I, that translates into, could you give me the translation? I think I have it wrong. I think it means move fast, but slowly. So it's um, the Latin term, and it was so funny that you would say that but it translates, hurry slowly, hurry up slowly. But, I, but may I just say one last thing to you, and, and the joy of being an author has never, I've not felt it quite so strongly as with you, Kavita, and your audience. Um, you, you, you made me so happy to be able to, to write words that you read. And that's the other meaning of only connect. If only the author could connect to the readers the way you have allowed us to do that tonight. I could not be happier. Thank you so much. And goodbye to Aruna. <laughs> Thank, you so much. Thank you so much, Marianne. All of our listeners, take care, stay safe, and keep reading. All right. Keep Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody who came. Godspeed. Godspeed. Thank you.